categorical semantics for Schrodinger's equation. Good morning. Uh, well, as I said, I'm going to try to give a brief, broad picture of what you could do to give some categorical semantics to Schrodinger's equation in general diverse symmetric model categories, possibly with some notion of superposition, we'll see during the talk. So the outline of this brief presentation is we'll start with reviewing strong complementarity and its ties to the representation theory. This was partially covered by Will yesterday. And then we will see that quantum dynamical systems can be encoded as EM algebras and move on to consider them more generally as quantum symmetries because quantum dynamical system has a certain linear field to it. And we'll talk about their invariance. And finally, we'll talk about Schrodinger's equation as the defining equation of algebra morphisms. Now, to start off, just some basics, which I hope are by now a bit more familiar. We'll work with Dagger for Venus algebras, which have just adjoint monoid and comonoid, and we'll work with quasi special ones, which are special up to some invertible scalar. Now, I have some. Uh, shorthands in the presentation, but I'll just say structure, and by structure I will mean uh, Dagger was a special for Venus algebra, and I'll say commutative if necessary. Hopefully I will remember all the time that I have to say it. Now, we'll take strongly complementary pairs of structures, uh, by which we mean the unscaled by algebra equations. These should also be relatively familiar by now. And we will, for our convenience, define a notion of an internal group in a diverse symmetric model category to be a pair of strong structures which are strongly complementary and the green one will take to be commutative and have enough classical points just for convenience. There is a more general definition, but this makes my life easier today. Now the first, well the reason it's called an internal group is because, as Will already showed, by Hopf law it can be shown that the red monoid acts as a group on the green classical points, and this is just a consequence of the fact that the antipode cancels out in half law. So the antipode acts effectively as a group inverse in this case. So this is where we depart from Will's presentation in a certain sense, but this should not be uncharted territory. We define the we call the adjoints of the red classical points multiplicative characters because ultimately they are group homomorphisms from the red monoid to the monoid on the tensor unit. And we'll see in a second that for the abelian case, they correspond to what we usually call multiplicative characters in Hill. Well, FD Hill. Now, the green monoid dually acts as a group on them. This is just a pointless multiplication group, but we'll not really use it here. It's used in another work, which I have with Will, which is on Fourier transform, and there it actually plays a role. So I said that I would need some notion of superposition. Uh, I'll not go into the details of how you get a notion of superposition. I'll just say uh, I will assume at times that my symmetric model categories are enriched over finite commutative monoids, not groups. I don't need groups. Um, and have appropriate distributive law. This is fairly standard. And this is so that I can talk about resolutions of the identity, by which we mean the usual thing except that I will not say that the families are taken to be finite, orthogonal, and normalizable, because otherwise that writing there doesn't need to make any sense in a general category. And more than resolutions of identity, I will actually talk about partitions of a certain state. I'll talk about partitions of the co-unit. But the two notions are related by an equivalence uh, for internal groups. I will talk about multiplicative characters, and the fact is that they form a partition of the co-unit, if and only if they form an orthogonal basis in the usual sense, so a resolution of the identity. And this is a, diagrammatically, it's quite quick to show. So just assume it, when I say they form a resolution of the co-unit, just think they form sort of uh, an appropriate, sorry, partition of the co-unit, they form a, an appropriate resolution of the identity. That's what should be in your head. Now the thing is, this only holds when the red structure is commutative, so it doesn't really cover the non-abelian case, uh, but we'll see in a second that that can be appropriately generalized. Now, multiplicative characters are called like that because in Hill they are exactly the linear extensions of the usual multiplicative characters of the group. Uh, they take the usual form of powers of a root of unity when the group is cyclic, so there is nothing really surprising here. The name is 
appropriate. In the non-abelian case, I said there is an appropriate generalization which instead of multiplicative characters involves representations and the associated characters, so not necessarily multiplicative, and it turns out that the representations form a resolution of the identity if and only if the characters form a partition of the co-unit, so the theory can be appropriately generalized and from now on I'll just say character and for the abelian case you should think multiplicative character but that makes the statement general. And half the hill, such a resolution of identity exists by the finite dimensional version of Peter Weil theorem, and this means that our theory covers both abelian and non abelian symmetries. So once in a while I will say quantum symmetries instead of quantum dynamical systems, because in the non abelian case it doesn't really look like what you would expect as a linear dynamical system, but it's still a symmetry. Good. Uh, yeah, okay. So finally, what, what do we mean by a dynamical system? Basically, we mean the quantum classical version, if you're familiar with the language, of a group action. So we mean an island or more algebra for the monad induced by the red monoid, i.e. something that satisfies an appropriate multiplication law and an appropriate unit law. That's for if you consider it only on the group elements, so the green classical points, that is exactly a group action. There is nothing more to it. So those are the two defining equations of the group action, because the red dot is just a group unit. We'll further ask for these to be unitary, i.e. to be green controlled unitaries, or equivalently to satisfy that equation, which says that the action at the group inverse is just the adjoint. And this definition is not restricted to abelian internal groups, it is a general definition, but in FD Hilb, for abelian internal groups and the cyclic case, it gives the usual families of unitaries generated by some unitary U. So that is that recovers the familiar notion of a finite cyclic quantum dynamical system. I don't know if this will ever catch on, but just in case I will say it here, it may be called quant categorical quantum dynamics. I don't know, we'll have to see about that. Um, we'll see. Anyway, brief on, since I said that they are called quantum symmetries, an important aspect of symmetries is that they have specific associated invariants. So this is a brief section on that. Uh, an observable is defined as in the um, quantum measurements without sums and quantum and classical structuralism papers. It's taken to be a self-adjoint algebra of the classical structure. So it satisfies a multiplication, which just says that you do it twice, you'll get the same result twice. And it satisfies an appropriate co-unit law, which says that if you forget the classical data that you obtain, then the system was not disturbed. And it is self-adjoint in the structure. So these are the familiar properties of an observable. And indeed, if you assume to have a super appropriate superposition operation and characters that form a partition of the co-unit, then this takes the usual form of a projection body spectrum. So it is just a sum, a complete family of self-adjoint, idempotent, orthogonal maps indexed by the characters, which is exactly what you get in Hilt as an observable. So in FD Hilt, for the abelian case, they correspond to observables indexed by classical points, and for the non-abelian case, they still correspond to observables, but they're not really indexed by classical points, they're indexed by a subset of those. They're indexed just by the characters, which don't form a basis in the non-abelian case. But the theory still holds true. If you only consider the characters and you only talk about those, then the indexing is, works exactly as in the classical case, and the theory can be appropriately extended. So you can talk about the invariance of symmetries as observables in a certain sense which is the fundamental point of this, I guess, it's that the, if you fix an internal group, not necessarily abelian, then you have a unitary dynamical system if and only if the adjoint of that map is a red classical observable. And we can call that classical observable Hamiltonian based on a hunch, and it turns out that it is actually, in the usual case, the Hamiltonian, so it's not a, it's not a bad naming, it's not a random naming, it actually uh, boils down to the same thing you're used to in Hill, and you can see this by just 
noticing that the characters indeed encode the energy levels as we usually expect them, as the phases that they give in the, to the eigenstates in the time evolution, and the projectors can be obtained as appropriate averages with appropriate phases. This is a generalization of von Neumann's mean ergodic theorem. And then these projectors just coincide with the ones given by the projector value spectrum. It's a quick check. And it means that the name given is actually sound. It recovers the usual notion of Hamilton. Um, so we can call the adjoint of the quantum dynamical system the CQM observable corresponding to the traditional Hamiltonian observable, because it does the same thing. It has the same projectors and the same indexing spectrum. This is not really particularly important. Schrodinger's equation. Person. Yes. So in your set of G is a group. But uh, G is uh, not, it's a uh, space. In Hilb, it's just, uh, you can think of it as L2G. Yeah, yeah, but it's a group. Uh, I mean, uh, in order to have a mo uh, monad or monad, it's enough to have a monoid. Yes. So what, what does it add to have a group instead of a monoid? Where does it play a role? It plays a role in the unitarity. You can talk about the inversion. Because uh -huh. otherwise you don't recover unitaries. You recover other things. You recover more general dynamics, but you cannot say that the adjoint of this. So the problem is the co-monoid Part. So the co-multiplication and the co-unit aspects of an observable recover an algebra in the dual for the adjoint. But the self-adjoint part is the adjoint of the unitary part. So you cannot say that if it's not a group, if it's just a monoid, you cannot say that there is a duality because the self-adjoint part has no correspondence. Now it could be interesting to see what happens if you take just the adjoints of uh, the joints of a non-unitary algebra over some monoid and then see what kind, what notion of observable it gives you, probably something interesting. But I think it loses the connection with the, between the dagger and the time inversion, which is the reason you put the unitary there. Does that answer it? Okay. Um, so Schrodinger's equation, Schrodinger's equation is uh, meant to give you exactly the orbits of a state under the time evolution. So first of all, a brief mention of what an orbit is in this framework. It's just the quantum dynamical system applied to some initial state psi. It's nothing much to it. This is a very concrete definition, but luckily there is an equivalent categorical definition, which is that orbits coincide in any Dagger symmetric model categories with the EM morphisms from the red multiplication to the quantum dynamical system. And this is completely abstract. It doesn't say you take a state psi and you apply the dynamic to it and that map is defined to be an orbit. No, those will always have that form and you can prove it quite quickly. I'll not go over it, but as you can see, the two directions are actually fairly short chains of equalities and fairly straightforward. What comes out of it is that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian also turn out to be related to orbits, as they are exactly those states that can be obtained by applying orbits to multiplicative characters. And this is an exact correspondence between the two, which comes in, which comes very useful in defining Schrodinger's equation in a couple of slides. Uh, I will not have time to prove this, but it's again a relatively short chain of equalities. Uh, diagrammatically, it's quite straightforward to prove. So finally, Schrodinger's equation, the time-dependent in the continuum version of Schrodinger's equation is usually written as a differential equation, but we can't really work with that because, well, it's a finite case and there is no derivative. Well, there is no suitable derivative. Um, but we can take the exponentiated version and that should or could have some kind of parallel, except that there is no infinite decimal generator in finite dimensions. Such a thing does not exist, and this could seem like a fairly severe bug of this theory, but in fact it isn't a bug, uh, it's just that it, that's the wrong way to think of it, and I can talk about it later if you want. Um, there shouldn't be such an infinitesimal generator in that form in the finite case, because the typing will be wrong. Anyway, we move to the time independent, which is just an eigenvalue equation, and we remove the Hamiltonian again, so that it's gone forever, it doesn't appear in our equations anymore, and we only have the phases on the left and the evolution operator on the right. And this has a fairly straightforward parallel, which is just obtained by replacing the one over h bar with two pi over n. 
and those things on the left we've already seen to be the evaluations of the multiplicative characters at the different group elements or time states, if you think of it as a Schrodinger evolution in time. Now, we can write this diagrammatically. The leftmost state is just uh, an energy eigenstate, which I said before is always in the form of an orbit applied to an appropriate multiplicative character. And to it, we have applied the unitary evolution operator at some time step t. And, and at the center, we have the right hand side of Schrodinger's equation, which is just the same eigenstate times some phase, which can be appropriately obtained as from the multiplicative character and the group element, and we just rewrite the central state as the rightmost state because then we have two maps applied to the same inputs, and in FD Hill we know that there are, we assume that there are enough group elements in our definition of an internal group, and we know that in the abelian case we have enough multiplicative characters, because these are the red uh, classical points, or well, the joints of the red classical points, so the equality for each chi and each t in FD Hill for the abelian uh, internal groups is the same as asking for the two maps to be equal. So we get the theorem that states that asking for a usual sequence of states, like a classical one, to be a solution of Schrodinger's equation is the same as asking for its linear extension. Oh, there's a, so that, that e should not be there. For its linear extension phi e, sorry, phi, from G to H to be an EM morphism from the red monoid to the quantum dynamical system. Now this is a general definition, it doesn't require, it doesn't really require any abelian internal group, so we will take it, it doesn't even require enough red cross points, even if the internal group is abelian, because in some categories you may not have them, like in FREL. Uh, but this still makes sense and it still works out as the usual, so we'll take it as our definition and we'll say that the morphism Psi is a solution to Schrodinger's equation, if and only if it is an EM morphism from the red multiplication to the quantum dynamical system. And we can start validating this definition by checking that it has some of the bizarre properties of a solution. Uh, solutions to Schrodinger's equation in this sense are exactly the orbits of states. We saw it at the beginning, so this is good, it's a good start. And furthermore, they recover the orbits, as in, in the concrete group action on the initial state by just evaluating them on the group elements. So that's the other, that's the other important thing. We should be able to call them orbits in that sense. They have another feature, which is that uh, they also encode the spectrum corresponding to that configuration of the quantum system. So the same orbit, because of the linearity of the uh, symmetric neural framework, encodes both the orbit values when evaluated on the group elements, basis, and the energy spectrum, if you want to use the usual terminology, when evaluated on the multiplicative characters that index the energy projectors, which is quite a cool feature, and it's really, really handy. It's, a, it's actually related to the fact that Fourier transform and strong complementarity are pretty much the same thing, but that's a matter for a different paper that we are writing with well. So to conclude, we've provided a framework for the treatment of dynamics, uh, quantum dynamics in CQM, and we showed that quantum symmetries can be thought of as unitary EM algebras, that observables, we use the fact that observables are self-adjoined EM algebras to show that symmetries are exactly adjoined to their own invariants, so that's a very handy way of obtaining the invariant for a symmetry, or the Hamiltonian for a quantum dynamical system. And we showed that Schrodinger's equation can be taught as the defining equation of EM morphisms. And we got the usual conclusion that its solutions correspond to the orbits of states, and the extra conclusion that, in fact, they also encode the energy spectrum. There is a lot more work going on on this. There are many branches that I am currently or planning to explore. There is, you can conclude by using the fact that strong complementarity is basically the canonical commutation relations, uh, the existence of finite dimensional time observables, and you can give necessary and sufficient conditions on when this happens. Uh, you can talk about the synchronization and emergence of clocks in quantum mechanics. You can talk about symmetries and particles. I've just started on this, but this is like one of the most common uses of non abelian symmetries. And finally, I would like to have an infinite dimensional generalization of this that goes to Contragin theory and uh, the GM theorem, 
but that is further down the line because the framework for CQM in infinite dimension is much harder to work with than the finite dimensional one. Anyway, this is pretty much it. Thanks for your attention. So the part where I say that it doesn't yeah. exist, it's yeah. actually wrong. Exactly. Um, what do you mean? Um, so an infinitesimal generator exists in a certain sense, as in it exists because you can pick a specific uh, integer number or rational number, and you will get the diagonal of the unitaries, and you will get exponentials with some rational, and that rational will be a real number in a good sense, but it is actually the wrong type because that rational is equivalent to any other rational modulo Zn for some n. So you should actually not think of that rational as the energy because it is cyclic under some relation. The rational actually lives in a Pontryagin group and the Pontryagin group is isomorphic to Zn in the finite case and there is no Zn subgroup of the reals. So technically from a group theoretic perspective that's not really a sound identification. In the infinite dimensional case, the reason it works is because the Pontryagin group of the real numbers, which is the usual time translation group, is exactly the real numbers. So you can pick uh, what you would call in usual quantum mechanics a choice of units of energy, which is what that h bar hides, and that choice of unit of energy fixes an isomorphism between G, the Pontryagin dual, and the reals, and that isomorphism allows you to think of energy as a real number. But in general, that isomorphism may not exist. Uh, it also works for the bounded case because the Pontryagin dual of S1, which is what you think of as a bounded one-dimensional particle, would be periodic, obviously. I mean, uh, would be the integers, which are a subgroup of the reals. So from a group theoretic pr perspective, there is, again, an isomorphism there, which allows you to think of them in the reals. But in the finite dimension, there is no isomorphism. So it's fine. You can pick a candidate that is a real number, but that doesn't really tell you much about it. So group theoretically, it's not a very sound choice. You can always pick a candidate, but you could always also call them like energy one, energy two, energy three, and remember what they are, and that will be the same. Are there that, any other questions, quick questions? Uh, yeah, so it was about the uh, replacement of uh, h bar with two pi over n. So n was, what was n? Was the dimension of the system? And yeah, I'm just doing the cyclic case, because that's right. the familiar so then, one. So then, did that maybe just say a little about this? But does that mean like our energy units are scaling inside the system? Um, we use different units and we use different sizes, things like this kind of thing. So no, the, the real scaling part in there is given by E rather than 2 pi over n. So the 2 pi, you should think of... Maybe you should just absorb the n into the... No, because the n is just the fact that, that you're picking uh, powers of a root of unity. So that you should think of E to the i minus, to the minus i 2 pi over n as omega and ignore the fact that there is an n. The n is in the, fa it's in the Pontryagin dual. It's just that the dual is given by powers of certain roots of unity. And so it's like phys 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 yeah. physically, we usually think of h bar as being totally constant, so I'm kind of thinking about uh, it. It's not really, because you could measure it in different units and you could measure the energy in different units. So the, the expression itself is invariant under change, but you would be perfectly able to scale the value of h bar by something by correspondingly scale the value of the energy by something else or the value of the time by something else. And that is actually the automorphism of the reals. Because it turns out that the automorphism of the reals is just the multiplicative non-zero real numbers. So that is exactly what you think of as a measure, change of units of measure. Yeah. 